All right, so we're gonna go um, back to Mark 3, 7, and we're just gonna go like a rapid fire verse by verse to kind of um, do a review from, from last time for those who didn't, who didn't see it, weren't able to, to watch it. So I just wanna make sure that everybody is uh, um, on page. And so we are excited. All right, so Mark chapter three. Now, uh, Mark three, this is, um, if you wanna kind of place it where, when it's happening, it's happening around Capernaum, around the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus, Jesus ministered for about a year. Um, consistently he would go down to Jerusalem um, during the feasts then he would go back up to his headquarters and so um, so that's kind of where he is uh, parallel scriptures would be Luke 4 and you remember he started his ministry in in the city he was raised and so so uh, so we're picking up at verse 7 and uh, so it says right here, But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and the great multitude from Galilee followed him and, and from Judea. So we see there's people are following him, not only in Galilee and around, but um, from down south, from Judea. Because remember, he did miracles there when he went down the first time. And Gospel of John kind of explains his first seven days of his ministry after he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. Most Gospels... Uh, start out his ministry in Galilee, like the, the revival that broke out. But John goes a little bit, kind of like before that. So if you want to know, okay, where, you know, when did it really, really start? You got to go to the Gospel of John after his um, after his uh, baptism, and then after the the wilderness period. So here we are. So they're following him. Verse eight and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond beyond the Jordan. And uh, uh, those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. Now, when it says beyond the Jordan, what it means is on the right side of the Jordan River. Now, remember, uh, uh, Israel is divided by, the, by, the, by that river. That's the river of Jordan. And so when it says on the right side or trans Jordan, it means he went on the right side towards Idumea. Um, so modern day Jordan. So that's really close. Once you cross the river, there were a um, couple, you know, there were settlements there, Jewish settlements there, and there was an area what is called Diakopolis. There's 10 Greek cities where Jesus ministered. And that was very strategic too. And um, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get these terms to understand. So anytime it says beyond the river or trans Jordan means he's on the right side of the, uh, uh, the, the Jordan River. So, so he went there. Uh, for, uh, so they, uh, so he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. So he was pressed, and he needed to teach. So he would get on the boat, and he would just kind of uh, pull off a little bit, and then he would teach from the boat. Verse 10, for the reason why people were crushing him and following him. For he healed many. So that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. So now they know that power of God is released through his garments. So you can imagine, like somebody tells you, you know, I heard people touch him and get healed. So somebody that's really sick, well, what do they do? There's, there's so many people pressing in. Have you ever seen like a touchdown in football where people kind of go over the people down? Yeah, something like that. They would jump over people just to touch him just to get near so the power of the Holy Spirit would be released through him and would heal them. Um, so that's what it says. They pressed him. So verse 11, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Again, every time he would walk, the demonic would, would uh, recognize his spiritual authority. They knew who he was, but he would always rebuke them. He did not want worship from the devil. Um, he wanted people to worship him and acknowledge him. He didn't need their worship. In fact, he made it clear that they were his enemies, and uh, he came to actually defeat or destroy the works of the devil. So there was no... Friendship, so he didn't want to hear anything positive that the devils wanted to tell about Jesus. Even though they had, they gave right information about him, right? They said you're the son of the living God. He would rebuke them because he didn't want to hear it from them. 
Verse 13, And he went up to the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Now he went to pray. Every big decision um, where Jesus would go, um, things he would do, he did it in the context of going to the mountain or a place where it was like a desolate place where nobody was there, and he would pray. And that in itself was very unique because as being son of God, he was in his father and his father was in him. He had, I mean, full communion with God as the son of God. But as a man, uh, he, he did not rely on, on the power of his divinity. He couldn't do that to qualify as a high priest. He had to do it uh, the way like we do it, like, like the human way or, the, or, the, or, like, or like people uh, talk to God. So he talked to God through prayer and he relied completely on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He did not rely on his power as God, but rather submitted himself completely and totally to the leadership of, father, of the Father and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Complete submission. And that's how he did it. So he prays and he, um, the Father, he receives from the Father who to choose. But then it says that he really wanted those guys. So it's kind of like Jesus wanted those guys and God says, I want you to have those guys. So it's this mutual thing that, 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 um, that Mark kind of highlights here. Verse 14, Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now remember, he had disciples that were kind of following him around. But they were just part of the throng of people. Now this time he really separates them. Now he's going to be really teaching them because he knows, um, you know, two years or two plus whatever years he would be crucified. And he, ha he was, had a very short amount of time to impart a lot of the things that he had to teach them so that they, when he would, you know, die and ascend into heaven, resurrect and ascend into heaven, that they would take the gospel to the nations. So he had a very limited time, a lot to do, a lot to say. So he picks the 12 and he calls them out to preach. Verse 15, and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. He gives, I mean, this is unprecedented that a man could delegate power of God to another man. I mean, it's unheard of. I mean, you, you go through Old Testament, not one prophet had such spiritual authority that he would delegate power to cast out devils and heal the sick. Well, of course, Jesus is more than just a human, a man. He's fully God, and he's, of course, the only one qualified that he could impart his authority, and he would give it to them uh, for the ministry work. Then there's, I mean, there's a, there, I think there's four lists of the names of the apostles. So don't get confused if you read one list. It's like, read the second list, like, well, these names don't really match. Many of them had many names. Um, you know, like and surnames. So I, there's four lists, but they're same guys. So just sometimes uh, different names are used to identify them. Well, Simon, of course, we know who Simon is, to whom he gave the name Peter. Now he renamed Simon into Peter. Now Simon was actually uh, not a rock. I mean, he's, he's, he, when, he, when Jesus gives a name, I mean, there's implications, right? He says, he says, Peter, Peter, you're going to be the rock, solid rock. And I don't know what people, Peter was, was you know, thinking, because he was nothing but solid. I mean, Peter was kind of like all over the place, all over the place. But Jesus looked past that. Now, he's, he, he sees forward. Like, we look like now, oh God, I'm so unqualified. God looks like 20, 30 years down the road, right? So he says, nope, you are the rock. Right now, you're maybe not or not the rock, but you will be for sure. I'm going to name you Peter. Um, all right. So James, the son of Zebedee and John, the brother of James. So there's two brothers, Zebedee's. I'm sure they knew Peter really well. They were fishermen. So probably somehow um, either they were related or maybe they were just a really good friends that they would um, work together. To whom he gave the names Boan or Jess, the, or that is the son of, uh, sons of thunder. Now, um, again, he identifies them and he says, you're going to be the sons of thunder. Now, if you remember, there's a place in Luke where um, truly they, John, now we read John, we think like 
very mellow, very humble, right? You read the, the uh, epistles, you read the, uh, the Gospel of John. He, he talked about himself as the one that Jesus loved and seemed like very, very chill guy, you know. But Jesus said, nope, they're the sons of thunder because when they were training uh, with Jesus, they were w going through a Samaritan uh, town in Samaria, one little village on the way to Jerusalem. And uh, they look like Jewish people, and usually Jewish people don't go through Samaria. They would take detours, but Jesus says, I'm going to go anyways. And they didn't accept them or did not receive them in one of the towns. Basically, they couldn't buy food or whatever they needed. And so John says, hey, why don't we call down fire from heaven? You know, like Elijah did. You know, Jesus says, no, no, you will call down the fire from heaven on, Samar on Samaritans, John, and James, but that's going to be later in, uh, in Acts. They came, remember, uh, John would come with, the, with Peter, they would lay hands and, and they would receive the Holy Spirit. So, so he's, you know, has, he's, he's very um, buoyant, like, like very forward. Um, and so that's why Jesus called them the sons of thunder. That's how they were. But of course, uh, Jesus uh, saw forward. John's going to go through a lot of changes in his character and all of those things, just like us, same way. But he calls himself, and they wanted to sit on the right head, on the right and the left uh, side of Jesus when he, when he reigns, right? He says, like, Jesus, you know. In fact, another place it says that they asked their mom. So mom comes and it's like, hey, Jesus, I want to tell you something. Like, okay, well, you know, my sons, just let them sit, one on the right, one on the left in your kingdom. You know, they're a little closer than the rest. And then, of course, you know, the rest, people, the rest of the disciples find out they're, Furious, like how dare you? <laughs> That's the early church, my friends. Okay, it's what Jesus had to deal with humanity, he, you know. And so um, he probably thought, "I have a lot of work to do." And so here it is, verse eighteen: Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, um, or Levi. Um, there's another place that called him Levi. Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into a house. So he picks the 12. And they're actually called apostles. Or in other places, uh, from disciples, they became the sent ones. Apostle means to be sent. So when somebody moves in the apostolic, it means he's sent to preach the gospel and establish churches. Okay, um, I know, of course, the term people use in different ways. Uh, people think, well, if it's an apostle, it's like, something grand something huge like people like don't dare call this guy an apostle right apostle simply means sent and there's giftings for that and so if some of you will have the apostolic anointing so don't be shy and and say it, once you recognize those giftings and that calling it is apostolic there's nothing you know like people build it up like because of the total apostles you know how amazing they were and so on it's it's really just being sent so if you're sent to preach the gospel and plant churches, you are an apostle, by definition. Um, so that's how he, he uh, called them. All right, so verse 20. Then the multitude came together again, so they could not so much as eat bread. Again, it's the dynamic of a revival. No time to eat, no time to sleep. Why? Because there's so much need and they're pressing in. I mean, they go into the house, house is surrounded. You're like a hostage, like you can't do anything. I don't even know how to went to the bathroom. I mean, like you have people all over you, all the time, every time, like no privacy. Someone says, hey, I want a revival, yeah. Yeah, that's great. We contend for revival, but there's implications to that. Once God's power started moving and the healing anointing breaks out, there's gonna be tons and tons of people that, that are seeking to be touched by God in that way. So forget privacy, I mean, forget eating. Sometimes you, you, you work, you pray for people for hours. I mean, that's, that's the reality of of uh, servanthood and that's kind of uh, Holy Spirit highlights in the book of Mark that Jesus was a servant of all he was he was really giving it all uh, so anyway so all right uh, verse 21 but when his own people heard about this they went out to lay hold of him for they said he is out of his mind now who are those people now remember he is teaching in Capernaum it's about 15 Oh, I'm not sure how many miles it is to Nazareth. Remember, he went to Nazareth and there were his, his, his peeps, you know, he had his, his neighbors and relatives and they knew who Jesus was. Like he grew up on the streets, literally, and he shocks them with so much 
you know, power and grace and, and what he says. There's so much anointing and glory is released. And they're like, wow, our homeboy, you know, <laughs> we heard what you did in Jerusalem. Yes, right. But once he starts teaching them, they're like, well, we don't want to. We love the miracles, Jesus, but we don't like what you have to say. Once he started, because he started really revealing their hearts and their hearts were hard towards God. And again, you can go to Luke 4 to kind of read that a little bit. Luke uh, emphasizes that. Uh, look i think it's 417 so so they're like they're hearing there's you know he's he's saying he's he's god like whoa that's radical but there's miracles like what do you do with that and so they're so the neighbors came together and maybe they're sitting at their house and his brothers jesus brothers and maybe some sisters with their families they're like we have to do intervention we gotta go save our jesus something's wrong with him he's saying he's god that's really out there i mean that's crazy talk um but yet there's power dynamics there's people following him so they're thinking they're going to come and get him right all right so let's see what happens uh, verse 22 and the scribes who came down from jerusalem said he has beelzebub and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons okay so now at this point you have to understand because of of how much power is released through this man the leadership in jerusalem are very concerned because people are asking questions is he the messiah now everybody's waiting for the messiah but their idea of the messiah is from the book of daniel now the book of daniel there's there's um, you know we have the dream that nebuchadnezzar had with a statue with the ten toes and all those things it talks about the kingdom of jesus on the earth that will crush you know those the the, the rock kind of hits hits the statue in the feet you know the ten toes is the last world empire ten kings and it crushes it and 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 um, whatever is left of it this, uh, there's no trace of the world empires Jesus's empire stands for a thousand years and there's vision in Daniel 7 where the Son of Man is led to God and all dominion is given to him as king to rule over all the nations of the earth so that's the idea now they're thinking of Jesus in the second coming they did not recognize him in the first coming so when they are waiting for the Messiah, they're waiting for the Messiah that is coming on a white horse to destroy the enemies of Israel. Okay, a political and uh, a leader that that's, has so much supernatural power that lives forever. So that's their idea. So people are asking, hey, Pharisees, teachers, what's with this? Is he the Messiah? Because there's power is released through his life. So they have two choices. They're, they were kind of stuck. They're like, okay, if we admit that he is the Messiah, then we have to follow him or submit to his leadership, which they were not going to do. Of course, they don't want to relinquish control or the, you know, what they had over the people. And, but if, uh, how do you explain them the supernatural things? Well, they said, well, the second option is to tell people that he casts out devils with the power of the prince of demons, the powerful prince that, um, you know, that's through his power, he is doing that because people needed an explanation of what is happening. So at that point, they're spreading lies and rumors that Jesus is demonized. They said he's a false prophet. He's completely possessed by the devil. That's what the leaders of Jerusalem started saying to people that are asking questions. And of course, the relatives hear that, and so they're going to save Jesus from Jesus. And then you have the Pharisees going going up from Jerusalem to really, um, you know, just tell people that this man is a false prophet. Don't listen to him. So, so he had that the power dynamic, the glory, and the stigma attached with it. So, if you want to be used by God, get ready for stigma okay they'll tell you you have a devil they say you're out of your mind that's normal so normal yeah they'll say you're crazy very normal very normal very normal so don't get dismayed jesus did it so we're not bigger than our master so if they call them demonized they'll call us demonized so there you go all right so but he's uh, telling a parable and we're gonna there's a lot of the things here that uh, we can really glean into the spiritual realms here he just kind of breaks it down a little bit 
So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? He says, Okay, guys, come here. I'm going to tell you something. He says, Let's look at it logically. He says, Okay, how can Satan cast out Satan? How, how does that make sense? Verse 24. He says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now, here Jesus gives us insight that Satan has a kingdom. All right? That means that on this earth, there's a kingdom that is ruled by Satan. To be a kingdom, it means that it's highly organized. Mm -hmm. It's not like Satan's got like all over the place, not sure what he's doing. He's kind of like, like on a whim, very organized. In fact, because he has learned the structures in heaven, because he'd been there, and he, under him was, was a charge of the third of the heavenly hosts. So he was in one of the leadership before the throne of God. He was the premier, one of the premier leaders um, in, in, the, in heaven. So, so he knows God's structure in the kingdom of God. So, so he, he, he done it. So he took those principles and he applied them for his kingdom. Well, what does it mean? That means it's organized. So there's demon spirits over countries. There's angelic hosts that are set as rulers over country. And they influence presidents, kings, and all those things. And we can find that in the book of Daniel. It kind of breaks it down a little more how that looks like. Then there's demons that are set over cities. So their job is it's a strong man. He controls the city. The type of a demon determines what type of sins are prevalent in the city. So you can kind of know what the strong man is based on the types of sin committed to the city. And cities are different. Some cities is murder. Some cities is uh, trafficking, whatever, drugs. So you can know what the strong man is by that. Then it's broken down into neighborhoods. There's demonic spirits that are in charge of a neighborhood. Then it's broke down per household. There's demonic spirits that are placed on the household and their job is to do destructions. And when something happens, it goes up the chain of command, right? And then, so that's how he gets their, so that's how they receive information and that's how they support each other. Then it goes even into a smaller increment, it's in the body. The same way, they have, a, they have a chief demon in the body, then they have a lieutenant, and then you have a structured subordinates. Demonic spirits, different ones, different types, but they are subordinate to that one chief demon inside that person's body. So when you pray for deliverance, it's, it's useful to know that. So Jesus says the devil has a kingdom, it's real, it's not, it's, um, and it's um, highly organized. Now he says, if that kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. 25, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. Meaning that he's not divided, he is, he is very united in his purposes to do damage. Uh, for uh, in this earth then he's verse 27 that's a spiritual principle okay he says no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder the house he says okay again it's parable so we can understand right it says okay in the house um, I, you know, a thief wants to break in the house well there's a problem there's a guy with a sword he's really big he's really tough but there's a lot of you know, you know, money laying around and everything. Uh, just go and grab him. The only problem is, is that guy with a, with a sword. I mean, he will really hurt you, okay? So in order to plunder or take the possessions, you have to bind him. You have to eliminate the strong man. Then you can come in and take your bags and kind of, you know, on your own time, kind of pile it up. Don't have to hurry anymore. Not trying to like, dodge the sword thrust, you know, grab a little bit here, grab a little bit there. And that's what people do when they pray for a city, for instance, right? They pray, and that's what they do. They, 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 or they don't, they don't pray. They go and try to do certain things without binding the strong man first. And so they go preach the gospel and nobody's listening. People are cursing them out, all those, all those things, you know, that are happening to them. They can't plunder it because there's a strong man, there's demonic presence that controls the minds of people and all this stuff. So what Jesus says is you have to bind him first. Well, how do you bind him? Well, with the authority that Jesus gave every single believer, born again believer. So through prayer, you are binding the strong man. And when he is bound, then you go preach the gospel and people receive it. 
it just breaks out. So a lot of um, evangelists would send intercessors ahead of them for like a week or two to the city they're going, like a crusade. Let's say there's a Benihin crusade, all right? Everybody knows who Benihin is. So Benihin is huge. So what they would do, they would send a team, a prayer team first, like maybe a couple weeks before, maybe a little longer. I don't know. I'm just making this up. And they would pray. <laughs> I don't know Benihin personally, so don't take my word for it. I'm just making this up. So... And they would pray, and then uh, whoever the evangelist is comes in, and then there's fruit because they bind the strong man. So Jesus says that's, the, that's how you deal with um, those type of situations. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of what he's saying here. You have to bind the strong man, then you can plunder his house. Verse 28, now he's speaking to them. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. He says, okay, everything you say, you curse God, you curse me, will be forgiven if you repent. Verse 29, but he who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. He says, because you know, and again, Nicodemus kind of told us that in uh, John chapter 3. He said, teacher, we know you come from God. Now, Nicodemus is one of the leaders. He says, you know you come from God because those miracles no man can do. And, and the devil can't do them either. I mean, the devil can't open people's eyes. And, and, and so it, they knew he came from God. So he said, because you know I'm a prophet, I came from God, and I'm doing these things by the finger of God or by the Holy Spirit, because you know that and you say on purpose that I am doing this with the power of the devil, because you do that, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And because you blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you will never be forgiven for that. Okay, Jesus, that's heavy theology. Well, how does it work? Because, and I'm going to explain, because this scripture the devil uses in religious churches to bind people uh, lying to them that they curse the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit and they can never be forgiven. I've met many people that bought into the lie. It's a very clever catch that the devil uses to catch people. He gives them thought bad thoughts about the Holy Spirit and then he tells them that you have blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. And they're like, uh, oh, oh no, you know, oh my gosh, what do I do? I can't be forgiven now. And then they're in condemnation. Okay, that's a lie. The only, re or the only time somebody can truly like blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the person has to, first of all, I believe, has to be in a leadership position, has to know God or the scriptures really well, has to know what he is doing is a lie. It's not like just kind of came to his mind and he's like, oh, I'm not sure about these guys doing weird things at, at the prayer meeting. Is it Holy Spirit? Is it not? That, that, that's not black. They know it's God. Mm -hmm. All right. But they make a decision in their heart for whatever reason. Either they're jealous or whatever. Let's say this guy comes in town and nobody and he starts praying and people are coming and getting saved, healed, delivered. And this guy is like his church is getting emptied out because people are leaving his church to go to this guy who's nobody but the power of god is released through him but he wants to keep the people in it's like oh what do i do what do i do and he says well that stuff like the you know what they're doing shaking all that stuff whatever the, these tongues and they start and purposely say things they would know it's 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 wrong but they just to keep people in so they wouldn't go there well that's blasphemy of the holy spirit okay it's a leader, he knows uh, the Bible, he knows that God is doing that, but for whatever reason, makes a conscious decision to lie and say that all the manifestations of power are from the devil. Bad place to be, because that really seals your fate. Those people cannot repent. They don't have repentance. I mean, they, once, you, once they cross that line, there's no repentance. They actually have no remorse. They don't care. It's not like... They feel kind of like, oh, I want to repent, and they can't. They don't even want to because that is gone. They just their their conscience is conscience is seared. They're they're just getting their heart. They're not even responding to God, and God is not even dealing with them anymore. So that's kind of what it means. So he told them that they are blaspheming, or the leadership of Jerusalem was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Verse thirty, because they said he has an unclean spirit, because they did that on purpose, they knew better. But they did it to keep uh, influence within, uh, you know, within Israel, with people. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And he told them, you will never be forgiven for that. 
verse 31. Okay, so his family is trying to break in. Okay, so this is happening at the same time in that one house that we learned that he went in. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent to him calling him. So again, he's pressed with people, not his mom and, and um, brothers and sisters. The intervention has arrived, right? They walked, they, they're going to bring Jesus back. They're going to really set him straight, you know. They're, and so they're like, okay, call Jesus, you know, um, yeah, we're here. Verse 33, very interesting answer, okay? Verse 33, but he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who said about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Like, whoa, like people like Jesus, that's kind of mean, you know? <laughs> because in the Jewish culture, they really respected their mother and father. I mean, it was, it was a big deal for them. It's not like in a Western culture, maybe people, it's not like that. But in, in their culture, uh, the respect and all those things. What Jesus is saying, he's letting us know that because there's a blood relation, okay, he will not respect a person because of that versus a guy that's sitting right next to him. God is not respecters of person, all right? Doesn't mean your background, how amazing you are, how amazing your father was, your grandfather, how many generations you, you're walking with God, does not impress God, okay? He will not be a respecter of person. He says who he really connects with, okay? He says, this is, these are the people I want to be connected with, and he says, he says, verse 35, for whoever does the will of God, is my brother and my sister and mother. Those who are close to me are the people that are actually doing the will of God. That's who I want to be close to. Like, whoa, Jesus, like, man, can you imagine? Like, it's just Jewish people. It's not, it's not just, he's saying these things. It's really offensive stuff for them. But again, you know, God is not respectful of person. So he loves me as much as he loves you. He deals with me according to what I do and what I say. He judges rightly and correctly. There's no darkness in him. And, um, you know, if you want to go to the, a little farther, book of Galatians, uh, Paul actually rebuked Apostle Peter. Well, why did he rebuke Apostle Peter? Because Apostle Peter was engaged in a little bit of, a, of an issue where he, remember, he preached to the Gentiles and, and, and so, and he was open to the Gentiles. But when, when some brothers came from uh, Church of Jerusalem, some Jewish brothers from, uh, from James, he became a little nervous eating with the Gentiles. So he's like, well, I'm going to go sit here with my Jewish brothers. So Paul said, when I saw that, I'm like, Whoo. He, I got up and I, in public, rebuked Peter. I said, Peter, what are you? this is not the gospel. This is not the gospel. Jews and Gentiles, we all need Jesus. We're on the same level, on the same plank, you know. Uh, you can't do this hypocrisy where, where you're eating with the Jewish people because you're embarrassed in front of some leaders from the Jerusalem to eat with the Gentiles. So it is easy. So God is not respecters of person. And Paul makes that point that he's not. He will really deal with us according to what we say and what we do. Truly, he is not going to like, oh, you know what, since you're a Christian for 30 years, I'll kinda, I will overlook this little thing in your life. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> no, no. He is, uh, he is a, a righteous judge. And, but he's very kind and he's very loving. Even when he rebukes us, you know, and he corrects us, it's, it's with gentleness and love because he corrects us so we would change. The devil, when he, when he uh, tries to correct us, the religious demon, you feel condemnation and you feel worthless. That's how you can tell apart. When God convicts you, you feel hopeful. There's usually tears. You feel God's presence. And there's repentance. You know, the sorrow for God produces repentance. When the devil lies to you and says, Oh, see, you screwed up. And there's condemnation element to that. That's the devil. That's how you know. So get, get away from me, devil. Just rebuke that in the name of Jesus. So that's how you can tell. All right. Chapter 4. Do we have time? All right, let's go a few verses. There's no clock here, so I don't know. All right. And again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. 
parallel scripture will be Luke 8. That's, of course, the boat is Simon's boat, Simon Peter. It's his fishing boat. So again, the, the, you know, people are on the shore and he moves out a little bit into the water so he could speak to them. And the water adds the acoustic dynamics because the, the water, you know, the sound travels really far on the water. And how you know it, when you go to the ocean, you can hear people talking, you know, quite a distance. But the, so, so you have to be really quiet when you're there. <laughs> you can, literally, you can hear everything. So anyways, especially if you're talking about somebody, don't do that. <laughs> so Jesus, he knew that dynamic, so he would you know, move on the boat. And then um, in Luke, it's a par- Luke 8, you can see how Peter, it was Peter's boat, and there's a miracle attached to that, that it's not mentioned here. All right. Okay. Then he taught... <laughs> About the, the casting on the right side. <laughs> then he taught <laughs> the catching of fish. All right. Many, many fish. <laughs> then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching. Now, he's already starting to teach in parable, more in parables. Now, why does he uh, went into that teaching mode in parables? Like, like Jesus, just say it straight, straight how it is. Just be a straight shooter, right? Well, the reason why he starts speaking parables because of the whole thing that was going on. You know, they were, he was accused of being demonized and uh, people, some people were for him, some were against him. He spoke in parables because in a parable, you have to really go after it to understand it. If you don't care, you'll miss it. Okay? Because that's why it's in the parable. But if you grab hold of it and you go further, he will reveal it to you. That's why he speaks in parables, so that people that really want to grab hold of the things of the kingdom of God, they would press in, say, Jesus, what does that mean? And they start searching, asking God to reveal those truths to them, and he will. People that are like, ah, whatever, you know, I don't really care. I mean, it's, it's, they're not going to go any farther than just this parable. They won't understand what he's talking about. Like, oh, this is so confusing. You know, this Bible is boring. I don't want to read it anymore. But people that really want to press in, Jesus will, for sure, by the Spirit, break it down and make it understandable and applicable. So that's why when disciples would ask him afterwards, he would explain it to them. All right, so we'll do uh, ooh, it's a very good parable here. So let's do maybe a couple verses of the parable. Um, so he says, listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. Okay, so he's like, and there's a farmer, and he you know, took some seed, and he starts sowing um, the field. Verse 4, And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Verse 5, Some fell on the stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprung up, because it had no depth of earth. Verse 6, But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and became and because it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7. And some uh, seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, but it e- uh, and it yielded no crop. Verse 8. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. Now, he's setting up. That's his premier, I mean, this parable is in all of the three Gospels. And he, again, is using uh, analogy of a farmer and the ground, the type of grounds. So what he's talking about, and we'll, next time we'll break it down a little bit more because there's a lot uh, in it, is the four um, heart responses, right? The four hearts. Yeah. So, um, and... Uh, he's uh, explaining why some people, you know, ignore the gospel. They don't, they, it's kind of like they hear it and it kind of like one, uh, in one ear in and the other ear out. And he's explaining why some people are, uh, they get on fire, a little bit excited, and then they're done when pressure comes. And then there's some um, hard postures where they, you know, they accept it, they start working on it, but there's just so many distractions, so much worry and all those things, and they actually... Uh, choke out that, that word. So um, we will explain it because it's, it's going to take a little bit of time and I really want to break it down, but I just want to give you a little appetizer. So so read that parable and then we'll break it down uh, next Monday. It's 
gives you an understanding how people respond to the gospel. So you don't get upset why people are not listening, why some are doing and you know, why some are not pressing in all the way and all those things. He will explain why. Um, and that will be next time. So let's pray. Father, I'm just so thankful, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that your word runs swiftly in our hearts, in our lives, that the word of God prevails in our lives. God, we trust it completely. Thank you.